Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our afternoon series of Conservationists in Action. We talk to authors, scientists, uh, and others who are working in the, the field of conservation. And today we have a, a twofer. <laughs> we have a scientist and an author. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate to have Anders Halverson here uh, this afternoon, so welcome, Anders. We're Thank you, Mark. Glad to finally get you out to NCTC after our... Uh, way too long. <laughs> and uh, let me give you a little background on Anders and then uh, we'll, we'll hear a little about his new book. Anders uh, is an award-winning writer with a PhD in aquatic ecology from Yale University. He wrote his book as a research associate at the University of Colorado Center for the American West with a grant from the National Science Foundation. The book we're going to talk about today, his most recent book, is this fascinating uh, book with a, a great picture of a trout on the cover. It's called An Entirely Synthetic Fish, How Rainbow Trout Beguiled America and Overran the World. So nothing like a modest title <laughs> <laughs> to describe a, a little mm -hmm. game fish here. And, and uh, Anders, be before we talk in detail about the book, you, you do have an interesting background um, and, and this book kind of reflects it. Tell us a little about uh, your training. Um, sure, I'll, I'll just launch right in here. Um, I got my PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology, and a lot of what I was working on was, uh, or, or some of the tools I was using was sequencing DNA to look mm -hmm. at amphibians, the ecology and conservation of amphibians. And uh, one of the things that really got me going on this book is while I was sitting there pipetting away and pouring gels, um, I kept thinking about the way science was actually used in, the, in, in these policy debates that you see whether it's in the press or whether you're involved with them yourselves. And uh, so often it seemed to me that the science was being used to justify people's positions, positions that they'd arrived at based on some much deeper set of values. Yeah. And I wanted to sort of explore that. You know, I was here I was producing this science and wondering how that was going to be used. And I really wanted to explore that more in depth. Um, and so I, when I finished my PhD, I, I got a grant from the National Science Foundation to go work with a historian at the University of Colorado to uh, study, in this case, fisheries management and uh, the controversies that we have today and what their origins are and the, the deep set of values that, that go into that sort of culturally and at an individual level. Who was the historian you worked with? Uh, Patricia Nelson Limerick. That, that's who I was guessing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, she's been a longtime environmental historian. That's right. And, and superb. That's right. <laughs> and the result is this book. And the result is this and, book. And uh, you brought in a, a presentation. I think we'll switch to that. And I'd just like to let folks know, especially those of you who are tuning in from the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, at least the early stages of this story involve the uh, Bureau of Fisheries, which is, is mm -hmm. the earliest predecessor for us. And, and one of the things I really love about your book, and we'll see it, is um, it goes back to the origins of American conservation. George mm -hmm. Perkins Marsh, the, these old folks. Um, fish came first <laughs> in the right. eyes of our they conservation. Did. So tell us a little about the book. Um, great. So there's, the, there's a picture of the cover of the book. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit. The other, I told you one half of the reason I got writing this book, and the other half of the reason is I grew up in Colorado fishing. And uh, at some point I just stopped fishing, at some point in my teenage years. And I never really thought about why I had stopped fishing. Uh, really probably until I was sitting there pipetting away again. And it occurred to me that there really is this fundamental paradox involved in recreational fishing, in my case, fly fishing. I see it and saw it as a way to escape civilization, a way to escape industrialization, a way to reconnect with the natural world. And yet so much of our, our fish th that are out there that we're fishing for are very much a product of uh, industrialization and civilization. And so I started thinking about that and looking into that, and I came across these, um, these examples here. So, so on the top left, that's, a, that's the world record, or was the world record rainbow trout, which is a, a, a triploid. It's a fish that was caught up in Lake Diffenbacher in Alberta by a couple of brothers who stocked it forever. Um, then on the bottom, you have a genetically modified trout. So they've knocked out myostatin, so it just keeps producing protein and it's got, you can see it's got six pack abs. Yeah. <laughs> fish are not supposed to have six pack abs. <laughs> and then on the uh, right side is a picture of um, so a group at the University of Missouri that's feeding, that were feeding their fish creatine, which is the same bodybuilding yeah. supplement that Mark McGuire used in the Home Run Derby. Uh, and they state literally in the press release that their goal was to 
uh, creative, they, they thought fishermen would pay more to capture fish, harder fighting fish. So there was going to be a super fish out there for you to go, <laughs> to go catch. And I stumbled across an article in the, in the uh, Wall Street Journal from 1996 about Idaho. They were stocking these fish and they found the fish uh, weren't doing their job. They weren't actually taking the hook. And so they decided they needed to actually teach them to eat worms before they put them out there. So they right. were so used to pellets that they weren't touching the worms that people were putting out there. So you keep running across right. these stories. <clears throat> but those are sort of extreme examples, right? But even um, uh, going here, so, so rainbow trout are the most commonly stocked fish in the United right. States. And actually, it was hard to get this information since I know we're going out to a lot of state and federal agencies. The, um, there's not a consolidated database that shows us what's been stocked where. So I had to go to every state agency, and of course all the data was in all of these different formats, and try to consolidate it all. And once I pulled all that data together, you can see the results. The bar on the far left is the number of the pounds of rainbow trout that are stocked every year in the United States by the state and federal agencies. Uh, so it goes rainbow trout, and then it's brown trout, brook trout, and then uh, catfish, and the rest are uh, almost non-existent in terms of weight. We actually stock quite a few walleye, for example, but yeah. at a very small size. Um, so rainbow trout are far and away the fish that's stocked in the United States. Um, and as uh, people may or may not know, they're, they're native only to the Pacific Rim from uh, really from California up around through Alaska and all the way over to Kamchatka. Um, but we have now, they've been introduced to every state in the United States every continent uh, except Antarctica. Mm -hmm. um, and there's famous fisheries, you know, they're, they're not just there physically, they are a cultural icon sure. throughout the world. In fact, they were our state fish in Colorado up until 1994, and I think the state fish in Utah until 1997, not native to not either native. place. Nope. Um, I've got a picture here of some postage stamps from around the world, New Zealand, Malawi, the bottom is Oman, and on the right is South Africa. So, like I'm saying, they're, they're, a, they're a cultural worldwide icon, this fish, and yet I think so many people sort of take them for granted and don't really think about this fish. I know that was the case for me. I, didn't, I was catching rainbow trout as a kid. I remember learning our state emblems for Colorado, and it was the blue spruce <laughs> and the rainbow trout, and, um, and I never really thought twice about it until I started working on this. And so, and what I stumbled across when I really started investigating it was some, actually some really great stories. Um, and so that's what the book is really about. Um, so I, I, you, you mentioned the sort of origins of the Fish yeah. and Wildlife Service, and, and that's what I'll get into now. So in the 19th century, the United States was undergoing this um, industrial revolution that was unlike anything we'd seen before. And at least for the purposes of this story, it had, there, there, were, there were two significant components. Um, first of all, it decimated the fisheries up and down, especially up and down the East Coast. We had the, the, the rivers being used as sewers. We had a lot of dams being built. We had uh, intensive agriculture going on and a lot of logging going on. And it really destroyed the fisheries up and down the East Coast. Um, and second of all, uh, it created a sort of, it, it brought people in from the country, it created urbanization. Mm -hmm. So it brought people out of the countryside and into the cities, created a tremendous amount of wealth for the people who were running the show at the time, the Anglo-Saxons. And they um, became very concerned about their offspring who were spending, in their opinion, way too much time not working, sitting around indoors. Um, and I'm going to read a quote to you okay. <laughs> from Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., who was the... Um, who, who is or was the father of the famous Supreme Court Justice and uh, was a famous columnist himself at the time. And he, and he said, uh, such a set of black-coated, stiff-jointed, soft-muscled, paste-complexioned youth as we can boast in our Atlantic cities never before sprang from the loins of Anglo-Saxon lineage. Um, and that was, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> famously, yeah, I, I actually really enjoy that quote because I have kids myself, yeah. and of course we're worried about the same thing right, today. Nature right, nature deficit disorder <laughs> exactly. and so on, yeah. Richard Liv and nature yeah. deficit disorder. So it always gives me some comfort to know that they were worried about exactly the same thing 150 years ago. Um, and he, he wasn't the only one, you know, Teddy Roosevelt sure. famously warns about this. Um, and so what are we going to do about this, this problem? The state of Vermont asks George Perkins, 
Perkins Marsh to write a report for them in 1857 about their fisheries. And George Perkins Marsh is, this, is a fascinating character in his own right. He's considered by many to be one of the founders of the conservation movement in the United States. But he also, he wrote a biography of the camel. He wrote the first Icelandic English dictionary. He was Lincoln's ambassador to Rome. I mean, he, he, was, he was an incredible person. Um, and he writes this report for the state of Vermont about their, their fisheries. And just to show you that I wasn't cherry-picking that quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., I'll read you a quote from his report to Vermont. He says, he writes in this report about fisheries, we have become not merely a more thoughtful and earnest, but it is to be feared a duller as well as a more effeminate and less bold and spirited nation. <laughs> and so what are we going to do about this? Well. Obviously, we're going to get people out fishing again, right? That'll turn the boys into manly sure. men. And, you know, as he writes, democracy itself will be, that's the only way to save democracy is to have mm -hmm. virile men again. Uh, but there's no fish out there. So he points to the fact that we had just discovered uh, 15 years earlier, about 15 years earlier in France, how to artificially propagate fish. Right. That's the answer. So we'll artificially propagate these fish, stock them into these rivers, and the kids will go fishing again, and democracy is safe. Um, and the story just sort of goes on from there. So there's a hiatus. He, he, he urges the states to take this up. There's a hiatus after the, uh, for the Civil War. And after the Civil War, it comes roaring back with a vengeance, um, thanks in, a, in large part to Spencer Fullerton Baird, who's on the top right of the screen. Um, and he was the assistant head of the Smithsonian at the time. And this was a time when the federal government didn't fund science. Mm -hmm. Mostly what they, the, the only, almost the only science they funded was exploration and mapping. Otherwise, there was no National Science Foundation out there. Um, but somehow he convinced, not only was he a great naturalist, but he was very politically savvy. Yeah. And he convinced Congress to uh, put up some money to establish a one-year U.S. Fish Commission. And actually, just because I'm speaking to you and you work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Service, one of the congressmen warned at the time, he voted against this creation of the Fish Commission, he, there will be no end to the expenditures of public money before we get through with it, he warned. <laughs> but never More than 100 years later, he's <laughs> exactly. right. We're still going on. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow Baird got past him, yeah. overrode him. They established, but it's just going to be a one-year temporary right. thing to investigate the decline of the scup in, the, in New England. Um, so Baird does this investigation, determines that the fish traps that they have in the estuaries are, are uh, wrecking the spawning and that there's going to be no more scup if they don't start opening up the fish traps at least a few days a week. And he even threatens Massachusetts and Rhode Island that if they don't mandate this, the federal government will step in and will mandate it. Well, it's a complete disaster because, first of all, there's a scup baby boom the following year, so he's sort of discredited on the scientific front. And second of all, uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island call his bluff and say, come on, the federal government is never going to step in and, and force right. us to do this. And of course, they were right. The federal government wasn't going to do that. So he's sort of at loose ends. And uh, the American Fish Culturalists Association, mm -hmm. which is now the American Fisheries Society, goes to him and they say they, they've started a few years earlier basically to produce uh, artificially propagate trout for market. To, so they would propagate them and send them to New York and Boston and sell them to the restaurants there. And they convince him that what he needs to do is establish, t take on uh, fish propagation. Mm -hmm. And that, once again, being politically savvy, he says, great idea. Well, he says, sure, if you can get the funding, I'll take it on. So Robert Roosevelt, who is Teddy's uncle, who was a Congress member at the time, does it, pushes through a bill to get the federal government to get involved with artificially propagating fish. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. Um, so. Very quickly, artificially propagating fish becomes the focus of the U.S. Fish Commission. There is still some invest scientific investigation that goes on, but most of its budget is going to fish propagation. Um, and it becomes a very uh, big deal. So the picture on the left there is one of my favorite pictures. Yeah. That's uh, the unfinished Washington Monument rising up out of the mall there. And there's a horse-drawn cart full of milk cans which contain uh, fish fry. And they're bringing them, actually, if you look at a map, the Washington Monument is a little bit off center. Mm -hmm. And the reason is there was a pond right there on the mall, which became the first uh, 
pond, you know, pond for the fish commission to raise fish. And so they started this big operation. And on the right side is Central Station, which was right there um, next to the mall as well. And those are egg hatching jars in the background. And they started a big operation of raising fish and um, shipping them out all over the country. And they had these specially designed fish cars, um, which were, and the railroads were happy to provide free transportation because they were eager to get people using their, their, their trains uh, for, for personal transportation. They sure. wanted to haul people as well as cargo, right? Um, so they were happy to provide free transportation because they knew these fish were going to be stocked in the rivers along their route. In fact, some of the trains even developed their own fish hatcheries just for this purpose. And they would ship these fish out and stock them on the way. And the way you would do it is you would, um, because he was politically savvy, if you wanted, he would give fish, the fish commission would give fish to anybody or any group. But the only catch was you have to write your congress member to ask them. So that way the congress member was vitally aware of how important the fish commission was to his or her constituents. Um, so you would write them and say, I would like some fish for my lake. And they would say, sure. And they would send you a telegram a few days ahead of time and you would wait at the station and the train would pull in. They'd pour some fish into your milk can and you would go take them out and stock them wherever it was. And um, I like to read this quote too because uh, I have nothing but respect for Baird, but he was very, um, uh, politically savvy, like I say, and in, in one of his letters that's at the National Archives here in, in uh, actually it's up in um, Maryland, um, he wrote to one of his subordinates. One of his subordinates had complained that these fish aren't going to survive. You know they're not going to survive where these people are putting them. And he wrote, it does not make much difference what Rockwood does with the salmon eggs. The object is to introduce them into as many different states as possible and to have credit with Congress accordingly. If they are there, they are there. We can so swear, and that is the end of it. So they were willing to ship these things all over. Um, and it wasn't just, uh, there was another big movement that really was being pushed at this time, which was the acclimatization movement. Yeah. And that term has taken on somewhat of a different uh, connotation today. It's, you know, you hear it for people climbing mountains and going to different altitudes. True. But at the time, what it referred to was there was a big movement to transport wild species all over the world. The English were transporting them all throughout their empire. The French were doing the same thing. Um, and we had the same idea here, to transport these wild species and try to, in many cases, remake a place in the, in the ways of the old world that we recognized. Um, so we had in, in the United States, for example, a number of different acclimatizing societies. The reason we have starlings here in the United States today is because there was a, a sort of captain of industry who had been a pharmacist in New York City, and he concluded that Americans were going to be culturally impoverished if we didn't have all the birds that are mentioned in Shakespeare. So uh, starlings are mentioned in a line in uh, Henry IV, I believe, unless it's Henry V. Um, <laughs> and uh, therefore, he imported some starlings, let them go in Central Park, and Again, the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> um, so the same thing was going on with fish. And you know, during my research, I came across any number of letters in these in these in these magazines, the fish and uh, the fishing journals of the day about let's let the it's the age of social Darwinism also. Let the best fish, like the best man, win. Mm -hmm. So that's what they were thinking. And just let's just ship these trout around the world and around the country for sure and see who wins. Um, Okay, so um, this guy Livingston Stone, um, he was a minister. He was an interesting character, and I became sort of obsessed sort of pursuing him when I was working <laughs> on this book. And his narrative threads through the early part of the it book. It does, yeah. it does. And he's a fascinating character because he was this minister in New Hampshire, Charlestown, New Hampshire, not too far from Boston, and he traced his family lineage all the way back to the main Mayflower. Um, and somehow he got interested in fish culture in the early days of it. And at some point decided to chuck it, chuck being a minister, that is, and devote himself to fish culture. And um, he starts, and you can still see the remains of his ponds if you go visit Charlestown. Um, and he goes down to talk to Baird, being influential in the movement at the time in the American Fish Culturalists Association. He goes down to visit Baird, and one of the fish, of course, that they really want to recover are salmon on right. the East Coast. And <clears throat> because salmon have been wiped out. 
one thought would have been to go to Canada and get some salmon, but the U.S.-Canadian relations were at a low ebb at that point, so that wasn't really a possibility. So he says, let's go to California and get some of those salmon and bring them out to the East Coast. And this is in 1872, three years after the um, completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, Baird, of course, says, okay, he buys into this, and he sends Livingston Stone and a couple of assistants, and they take the, the train across the country. Must have been an incredible time to travel yeah. on that train. I mean, and if you look at these trains of the day, I mean, they were small compared to the right. diesel trains we have today. So you picture this guy traveling across the country on this train, and he gets to Sacramento, and he gets off the train, and he says, so, you know, so I'm here to get some Pacific salmon to ship back to the east, and they all say, well, there, there's no Pacific salmon left out here. And he says, what? And, 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 and they have, the hydraulic mining has been so intense in California that the bed of the Sacramento River was going up by six feet per year at wow. one point. So of course there were, that, that doesn't do the spawning beds no. any good. Um, so he starts asking around and finally he runs across a railroad engineer who says, yeah, I think I've, I think this, the Indians still spear salmon way up north on this river called the McLeod. So he sets out for the McLeod. And this is this minister who's never been out of New Hampshire or Massachusetts before. He heads up, um, takes the train as far north as he can to where they're still laying track, gets off, gets on the stagecoach, goes as far as he can, gets off and starts walking. And uh, sure enough, he comes, he starts walking up the McLeod and he and his two assistants see salmon drying on the bushes. And the wind two Indians are there and that is their, 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 um, their hunt, their, their fish right. catching ground. Um, now there's no, the reason the fish have survived there is um, one, because they haven't discovered gold there, but two, because the Wintu have driven off, killed or driven off every settler who has tried to come to the McLeod. And uh, somehow, and this uh, Livingston Stone convinces them to let him stay. And there are some threatening moments. Yeah. Um, he risks his life to do this. Somehow he convinces them to let him stay and build a fish hatchery. And start, he starts shipping fish back east. And for seven years, he ships Pacific salmon back east. And not then and not to this day do we have a run of Pacific salmon on the east coast. It was a failure. Um, but they started hearing about what they were, about this fish called the rainbow trout that another famous fish culturist, Seth Green, was experimenting with. He had shipped brook trout from New York to California to the California's acclimatizing society called the Ornithological and Piscatorial Acclimatizing <laughs> Society of California. There's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, in return, had shipped off this trout that they'd found swimming in their ponds, and he actually thought they were pretty good fish. So Baird and Stone decided to try experimenting with those. And Baird goes a few miles upstream and starts a rainbow trout hatchery, starts shipping these fish back. And within a few years, they become the fish. They're in 33 of 38 states then in the nation. Um, and they take off because they're easy to raise in hatcheries. They're very hardy, so they can withstand conditions that the brook trout can't withstand. Um, and they're good fighting fish. And re you know, remember, our goal here is to create manly men, Feral right? Man, yeah. So, yeah, so we need a good fighting <laughs> fish on the other end right. of the line. Um, so within a few years, these become the sport fish. And it just goes on from there. Um, this is a picture of the rainbow trout hatchery there. Um, and now I'm going to skip forward. So now let's flash forward about 70 or 80 years um, because it just keeps getting more and more <laughs> intense. Actually, yes. before, I, before I skip to that, no, I'll skip to Well, that. the hatchery lasts long a long time too, doesn't it? The, the, the hatchery Baird does. Station. It's now unfortunately underwater. underwater. I went out there trying to see it and unfortunately it was underwater. Would they put a dam up or something? Yep. Is that... yep. Oh, okay. yep. So it's under Lake Shasta. <laughs> Um, so you can't, it's two or 300 feet too. You can't even scoop yeah, it out if you want to see it. I just like how it was pure serendipity that they switched to rainbow trout. I mean, it, obviously eventually yeah. they would have found it. it. And you noted Seth Green, which I'd never heard before had actually yeah, he was been looking at this for a while. Well. But I mean, that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, uh, and as you know, they, they've taken over and still are the fish. Yeah. I've caught them in, uh, two states in Australia and uh, all over New Zealand. That's right. <laughs> it and never then, occurred to me that they 
Well, they should have. There's no native trout probably in New Zealand right. or Australia. And but. they're a big problem. And South Africa as well. <laughs> yeah. And they're a big, there's a big controversy right now in Australia because there are some people who want to get rid of them and some people because the galaxids are the native fish there that are in yes. trouble because of it. Um, in South Africa, there was a push to remove them. But another big supporter, group of supporters wanted to declare rainbow trout an honorary indigenous fish so that it was native under the law in South Africa. <laughs> And, of course, you've got these huge fisheries in well, uh, South America, Argentina. Yeah, and then, like New Zealand, I mean, the whole South Island, a big part of their economy was, was built right. on f fly fishing. And, and, you know, and it was weird. They seemed to prioritize, you know, well, maybe browns are better than rainbow, but they're all invasive. So right, <laughs> right. <laughs> nothing that was particularly <laughs> indigenous. Thing, right, it know. is fascinating. The debates that go on <laughs> about which, which is the better and which should, you know, which should be allowed to remain. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, this leads us right into the... Into the next segment. <laughs> so, story of Green River. So uh, in 1962, uh, we, the, the, uh, the citizens of the United States, decided to poison all the fish in basically the southwest quarter. It's not quite a quarter, but the southwest corner of Wyoming, a watershed that's 15,000 square miles. That's the size of Connecticut and Massachusetts combined. Um, uh, so that we could introduce rainbow trout. Now. I, I want to emphasize right away that, that um, the reason they got this idea was because they were building some dams. The Bureau of Reclamation was going to build a dam at Fontenelle, which is up, uh, you can see the Wind Rivers, there's a little white slash there just below there, and then down at Flaming Gorge, which is in uh, Utah. And these dams were going to fundamentally change that river. It, it was traditionally a traditional western river that flooded in the spring and uh, then got down to a warm little trickle in the late summer and was always full of sediment and shifting around. And it was going to change that to a consistent flow, cold water river. Um, and so their position was this is going to create an ideal situation to create this fishery. And um, there's some debate about how much they were thinking about the native fish um, when they decided to poison them out. But in any case, uh, there are people who still support this operation today, say it was the right thing to do at the time because they knew um, that the native fish, the humpback chub, the uh, suckers, the Colorado pike minnow, weren't going to make it. Um, though all the letters in the archives that I read, it looks to me like they just, it wasn't on their mind. Mm -hmm. uh, native fish were not, we, they did not think in terms of natives versus non-natives. That seems to me, anyway, that's just a paradigm that I take for granted, or did until I started on this book. But in 1962, they did not think in those terms. They thought in terms of game fish and trash fish, and that was it. Um, and, and you talk to some of the old fish and game managers, and they agree that they considered their job was to, you know, pretty much to establish rainbow trout wherever they could. Um, so they didn't think in those terms, except for a very few people. This is one of them, Robert Miller, who uh, was an ichthyologist, and he was one of the first people to study native fish. He was, I think, he and his father-in-law slash PhD advisor. Think about that complicated <laughs> relationship for a minute. It boggles the mind. <laughs> um, were the two Carl Hubs was the name of his okay. father-in-law. Um, were the two? They were the first two people, I think, to publish a even a paper about native fish in uh, the transactions of the American Fisheries Society. So they tried to, he, Miller went all out trying to block this thing. Um, and he was a very sort of uh, quiet person. He didn't enjoy you know, public speaking. Right. I think he might have had a stutter or something and, and, and was sort of shy around the public. As opposed to his father-in-law, Carl Hubs, who was sort of this bulldozer, A-type, gregarious personality. Um, but somehow the two of them had this fantastically productive relationship. And uh, Miller, he might have been shy about people, but he was driven. And he tried to stop this thing. And he went to uh, the Sierra Club. He went to the Ecological Society of America. He tried to get, you know, he went to the newspapers, tried to c get people to oppose this project. And he couldn't get any traction whatsoever. And he, he complains in one of his letters. You know, Americans have been brainwashed by this culture that prizes game fish over coarse fish. And indeed, this operation was known as the Green River Rehabilitation. And if you read the letters, it's about um, the fear is of recontamination 
by native species. Yeah. Once they've gotten rid of them, they don't want to be recontaminated right. by these darn native species. Since Once again, since this is a Fish and Wildlife Service um, operation, I'm going to read you a quote from the Fish and Wildlife Service press release at the day, who declared in their press release about this operation, biologists regard aquatic habitats as pastures in which the end products are fishes which can be taken by man by sporting means and which also serve him as food. If the aquatic pastures are inhabited by species which compete directly with sport fishes, little improvement can be expected by stocking with hatchery fish. It is considered, note the passive voice here, it is considered good management to remove the existing fishes and to restock preferred species. So that was the mentality at the time. Yep. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service provided the funding for this operation, um, and the state agencies of Wyoming and Utah were also involved. Um, so anyway, so Miller gets absolutely no traction. The operation goes ahead as planned. And the poison they used was rotenone, um, and it kills everything with gills. So it kills fish and aquatic invertebrates. And on the picture on the top left there, you can see the white. They, they set up these drip lines every 10 miles along the Green River. And the rotenone turns the water white, so you can see the white dripping into the stream there. Um, and what they did is they did it sequentially. So once the rotenone front from the uppermost drip line reached your drip line, you would turn on the spigot. And so this rotenone front pushed downstream, and apparently it was just an amazing sight, these thousands of fish thrashing in front of this rotenone front trying to escape this thing. Um, and it was an amazing sight and a complete success uh, in their mind. They, they absolutely wiped out all of the, or almost all of the fish. It was a military op scale operation. They had airboats buzzing around, helicopters flying over to get any sloughs that were off the main channel. And uh, interestingly, the picture on the bottom right is a guy who's gone out to collect a fish. So they um, urged people to come out and pick up the dead, the poisoned fish, and bring them home for dinner. They said there's going to be lots of fish sitting around. So people went out and picked up these fish that had been poisoned by rotenone and brought them home to eat which of course is fascinating today and controversial today because rotenone is now used, uh, and this is a very controversial topic, uh, but there are some people who absolutely oppose the use of rotenone anymore because it's now used in laboratories to induce Parkinson's disease symptoms in mice. Um, so we'll get onto that in a little bit, yeah. but it's sort of a fascinating uh, issue. Okay, so the operation is a complete success. They wipe out all the fish in the Green River, and uh, they had planned to do this operation as soon as Bureau Rec closed the dam at Flaming Gorge. And that way the poison would build up behind the dam and naturally detoxify because of sunlight. But uh, Bureau Rec delayed closing the dam for some reason, I don't know why, uh, until November. And at that point the water would have been too cold for the rotenone to be effective. So they decided to go ahead with the operation as planned but detoxify it by spreading potassium permanganate into the river off a bridge, and they picked this bridge here in Browns Park in Colorado. Um, and so what they do is they set up these drums, with, or what they did, set up these drums with potassium permanganate. And as soon as the rotenone front reached them, they started spreading it. Well, it was a complete disaster. So there was a cold front that comes through, so it's whipping wind and snow all over the place. And this is a three-day operation, so they have to be spreading this stuff for three days now. Um, the, the way they determine how toxic the water is below the bridge is they have these sentinel cages with a fish inside it, right? So you can imagine some guy in the middle of the night trying to look in this sentinel cage to see how well the fish is doing and then radio up to the bridge and say, you know, more potassium permanganate. <laughs> you know, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly how it happened, but tough conditions. Yeah. And uh, needless to say, some of this rotenone gets downstream. They don't have enough potassium permanganate. It's the wrong consistency for the spreaders. It's just, so rotenone gets downstream. And 16 miles downstream from this bridge is Rocky Mount, um, not Rocky, uh, Dinosaur National Dinosaur. Monument. Dinosaur is a big deal because just a few years earlier, uh, Brower and the Sierra Club and uh, the Wilderness Society and those guys had fought to, to try to um, save dinosaur from another dam that mm -hmm. Bureau of Reclamation wanted to build. And they, they waged this public relations campaign in the newspapers to convince Americans that our national parks were our national heritage. They were our cathedrals, right? And Americans bought into this, and they succeeded, and they blocked this. 
And so they just convinced Americans that dinosaur was our, not only were national parks sacred, but dinosaur in particular was sacred. Um, and second of all, this occurred almost to the day, within a couple of weeks of Rachel Carson's yep. publication of Silent Spring. And that was a huge deal that I, that I think it's hard to overstate. I, I think right. we don't quite recognize it today, but that book transfixed the country. And it, you know, it was about chemicals in our environment. Um, and so here is this one-two punch. We now all of a sudden we have dead fish who have been poisoned washing up within our national parks. And right. all of a sudden it becomes a big controversy. Now, whether the dead fish were actually poisoned in the park or not is unclear. Uh, probably at least some of them were poisoned upstream and were just washed downstream. Moot point, doesn't matter, because all of a sudden it's controversy and you know, it becomes a big deal. People are writing letters to Congress. Congress is asking um, Stuart Udall, who is Kennedy's Secretary of the Interior, new Secretary of the Interior, what's going on here? He has Park Service butting heads with Fish and Wildlife Service yeah. in the Interior Department over this operation. So he gets a, he commissions a review in which he and writes and signs this review that says, from now on, whenever a native species is imperiled by one of these projects, that needs to be one of the top priorities in evaluating whether the project should go forward. And, and those are big words in those days. It seems relatively normal today, but those were new, it was a new idea. He sets up a committee on um, rare and endangered wildlife species in 1963. This is about six months after this operation. Interestingly, he puts the same guy in charge of that committee who was in charge of the Green River operation. Um, and that committee starts coming up with a list. Actually, Miller is uh, one of the advisors for the list of fish, endangered fish. They put together this list of endangered species, and that committee leads directly to Congress passing the early, you know, there were two early iterations right. of the Endangered Species Act in 63 and 66. You know, that committee's work led directly to those iterations and ultimately to the um, 1973. Um, uh, Endangered Species Act, which right. is the one that's really enforced today, right? So it was really, as a re in, in many ways, I won't say the Endangered Species Act came directly out of this Green River operation, but it was certainly one of the main tributaries that fed into the movement that led to the Endangered Species Act. Um, and uh, so now, just to show you that things go full circle, uh, we've now spent more than $100 million under the Endangered Species Act trying to recover many of the same fish we were trying to poison out in 1962. In the Green River. In the Green River. <laughs> so things go full circle. It's, it's rife with ironies. Let me just ask you a yep. couple. The, the, two are very obvious, and I wonder if people commented on them. One, if, if rainbow trout were such a robust, competitive, survival of the fittest type species, why didn't they just let the rainbow trout outcompete the, the chubs and so on right. all the time? Um, Social Darwinian yeah, battle. Uh, <laughs> Uh, interesting question. Um, they were worried about, uh, they were worried that they wouldn't succeed and that these reservoirs would be taken over by other fish that they didn't want, both native and non-native. Um, but it's an interesting question. And then the other thing is, you, you made it pretty clear it was a, a death zone from the massive amounts of rodent mm -hmm. that, that affected not only fish, but potentially insect and amphibian life. What did the rainbow trout eat? <laughs> yeah, in there. <laughs> so very little. Um, yeah. <laughs> in fact, um, they would refer to the fish for many years thereafter. The fish you caught out of there were referred to as snakes <laughs> because there was so little to eat. So yeah. they would grow long and skinny. So you'd have these very, just the opposite of that fish that I showed. Right, at the, the opposite of what you want to catch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So they were these long, skinny fish because there was nothing to eat. So they would refer to them as snakes. But you know, over time, the, sure. the aquatic invertebrates recolonized enough that they had some food. Um, but of course, you know, today we st still mess around with that now. So for that reason, often when when we you stock um, trout, you also stock the food on top of them, right? And right. There's right. been interesting disasters that have come out of that as well with the mice and shrimp. But anyway, right. maybe that's <laughs> too much to get into yeah, now. But no, let's. But it is another, a whole another interesting, right. you know, <laughs> you, start, you start trying to engineer an ecosystem and you push one button and then you have right. to push more and more and more, right? Intervention begets more intervention and more intervention. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's so, go on with your story. Okay. I'll go on with my story. <laughs> I had to ask those two questions. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'll skip forward to, uh, again, another 30, 40 years to the present day. Um, 
And the, and the issue that really actually got me interested in this uh, initially was a uh, controversy that's going on in California at the time in the Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, and they have the mountain yellow-legged frogs there, which are native to these. They've got, you know, 10,000 gorgeous lakes. There's a picture of one right there, just absolutely stunningly beautiful. Um, but there were no fish in 95% of them. And uh, consequently, this whole unique fauna evolved up there, including the mountain yellow-legged frog. Um, and, but at the same time, so 100 years ago, uh, people start going up there and they see these lakes devoid of fish and they think, what a waste. And this includes not just the miners who carried fish up there to some of these lakes in their backpacks, okay. but also John Muir, mm -hmm. who was, he visited Livingston Stone at his hatchery and mm -hmm. became a proponent of fish, fish stocking. And so he, pro, he was a proponent of stocking the Sierra Nevada with, with fish. Um, so it's sort of interesting that sort yeah. of St. John Muir was also responsible for this. Um, so, so they did this for quite a while with putting fish in cans on horses and mules and backpacks right. and carrying them up there. But it's, it's not a very efficient way to, it's a, it's a lot of work just to stock one lake. Um, so after World War II, we had um, a lot of demobilized pilots from the war and a lot of military surplus aircraft. And a couple of these guys in California, uh, the picture on the top left, the man f second from the right um, is Carol Faist, who was, worked for California Fish and Game. And he was a bomber pilot in the Pacific during the war, came back, and with uh, some peers, with one peer really, they decided we can do this so much more efficiently than, than hauling them up there on backpacks. We're going to drop them out of planes. So they do these experiments that I talked to him for a while, and he's put together a really interesting sort of notebook of memories of these days, and it's, it's fascinating. Um, the first thing they did was they just tried to see if they could actually drop fish out of a plane. They put the fish inside a milk can, flew the plane up over the, this pond, and chucked the whole milk can out the window, and they missed. And so the milk can goes <laughs> bouncing along the rocks. And they go land and run over and look in the milk can, and there's still 16 fish alive in the milk can. And they say, well, shoot, if they can survive that, they can survive anything. Uh, but they do some more experiments. They hold, to see if fish can fly by themselves, they stick their hand out the window of the truck holding a fish up and gun it down the driveway as fast as they can, and then dunk the fish back in the water, and sure enough, the fish can survive. So they cut a hole in the bottom of that military surplus C-45 there, and... Uh, do a test, and they pour the fish out of the milk can, um, out the back of the plane, and psh, big spray of water, and a lot of fish go flying down, and sure enough, the fish survive. And so within a few years, you know, up until we intervened, 95% of the lakes in the Sierra Nevada had no fish. Within a few years, 95% of the lakes in the Sierra Nevada did have fish. And uh, this is this isn't just the Sierra Nevada, of course. We do it in Colorado. We, you know, this is an ongoing way of stocking fish. Um, but then we get up to 2000, 2001, and uh, at least, you know, a few people, including this guy, Roland Knapp, who's on the left, began asking questions about this. And this controversy is one of the controversies that fascinated me and got me going in terms of how the science is used, because everybody had noticed that the mountain yellow-legged frogs were declining in these lakes. The question is, what was causing it? Well, the, the folks, the fishermen, were sure, and they had the evidence to prove it, that it was pesticide drift from the Central Valley. And the agricultural folks in the Central Valley were sure, and they had the data to prove it, that it was the fish that were being stocked. So it was, you know, everybody had their science to yeah. back up their side of the story. Well, so Roland Knapp decides to do an experiment. He, and so he goes up and he, they're not allowed to use rotenone anymore in California because of the uh, to toxicity issues that I mentioned. So they gill net out, they have to gill net out the fish out of a few of these lakes just as an experiment. And that's an intensive operation. That's a three year operation, stretching these gill nets throughout these lakes, checking them, you know, they stay up all winter. Uh, finally gets rid of all the fish, and sure enough, the frogs do make somewhat of a comeback. Um, and so all of a sudden, this controversy erupts about whether game and fish, California game and fish, is going to need to. Uh, I mean, uh, Fish and Game is going to need to start removing these fish right. from these lakes. And they, in fact, start talking about doing that. Um, 
and uh, they stopped stocking. A lot of their aerial stocking, they just halted altogether because in addition to, to what he showed about their effect on frogs, he showed that many of these, uh, may, m much of the fish stocking was maybe unnecessary because these fish were naturally reproducing. And if you stock right. on top of that, you create stunting and maybe not even, a, maybe the fishery is better even if you don't right. keep this intensive stocking up. Uh, and California begins a, a comprehensive plan about how to manage these lakes. And as part of that, they talk about, and in fact, start going about removing fish from, it, from some of them. And this becomes controversial as well because they don't really want to tell everybody exactly which lake they're going to remove the fish from because the bucket brigade will be out, you know, in a heartbeat. And these lakes are within half a mile of each other. It's very easy to catch some trout from one lake and bring them over and dump them back in. So they sort of don't want to announce this because they don't want the public to just go and re it's an intensive effort getting rid of the fish. You don't want it to be ruined overnight. Uh, so it becomes this very controvers controversial issue and continues to be this very controversial issue in California. And then on top of that, to make it even more interesting, uh, amphibians are declining worldwide because of a chytrid fungus that's killing them. Um, and the mountain yellow-legged frog are being hit hard by this. So, so, but Roland Knapp makes this interesting point that, look, it's not just the frogs that are being affected by the fish stocking. It's the whole ecosystem that we, and in ways that we haven't even thought through. So there's this ripple effect that these fish you know, the, the biomass of aquatic invertebrates in a pond that, or a lake that uh, has fish is 100 times less, maybe, than the biomass of aquatic invertebrates in a lake that, does have, that doesn't have doesn't fish. Have um, and these are an important subsidy for these birds and ba proteins because they, of course, hatch and come out of the lake and create this very important protein subsidy for the birds that are up there for the summer trying to raise their young and the bats. And that's just beginning to be studied. And so it's... It's, a, it's an interesting and ongoing yeah. uh, operation and, and controversy. How much time do I have left, do About you think? Ten more minutes. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'll just skip to the last uh, really fascinating problem as well okay. that comes out of rainbow trout. And one of the major effects that they've had, uh, rainbow, rainbow trout are very closely related to the native trout of the Rocky Mountains, which are the cutthroat trout. Right. So closely related that they can easily interbreed with them. Um, and so, in fact, they've driven some subspecies of cutthroat trout to genetic extinction, which is to say you can't find any pure, uh, variety, any pure individuals. Um, and it's become a really interesting problem in uh, uh, the northern Rockies, for example, in Montana and Idaho, where <clears throat> you have the West Slope cutthroat, which used to have the uh, largest range of any cutthroat subspecies. But now, depending on who you talk to, it, that range has been dropped down to 20% or even 2% of what it used to be. And why, why the discrepancy in numbers? It depends on how you define a West Slope cutthroat trout. Um, so, the, so rainbows have been introduced all, of course, all throughout the Rocky Mountains. And they have interbred and hybridized with these cutthroat. And <clears throat> then the hybrids continue to spawn and hybridize and hybridize and hybridize. So you get these sort of hybrid swarms that are moving everywhere. And that picture on the bottom right is from the North Fork of the Flathead in Montana. Um, that's probably Glacier on the other side there, Glacier National Park. Um, this picture, I'm sorry, I don't have a legend up there, but the, the black dots are hybridized fish. Mm -hmm. The white dots are the only absolutely 100% pure remaining populations. And so the pure remaining, and this is from a paper by um, Hit, Christopher Hitt and others. Uh, hopefully people can see that on the bottom if they're more interested. Um, these, the only place you find 100% pure West Slope cutthroats are in these extremely isolated high headwater streams. And they're, um, the populations are so small in many cases that they're at risk of inbreeding depression. In addition, most likely, um, a lot of the genes um, that would have adapted these fish, these West Slope cutthroats, for main stem conditions would be different than the conditions for the fish that are up there in these high headwater streams. And you're never going to find those genes again except in the hybrid populations, right? So um, we've got this conundrum where the hybrid fish are both the primary threat to West Slope cutthroat because they're hybridizing with them, right. and yet at the same time they may be their only hope for salvation to uh, get rid of the inbreeding depression and maybe uh, provide them with these genes for these main stem conditions again. So it's this really fascinating conundrum. I don't envy the folks that are trying to grapple with this one. And you know, 
it, it raises this whole issue of what, how do we, what is a species under the Endangered Species Act? They, the, in fact, a group petitioned to get the West Slope cutthroat listed as an endangered species, and that threw it into Fish and Wildlife Service's lap. And they had to decide, what, what is a West Slope cutthroat? If you say it has to be 100% pure West Slope, no introgression with rainbow genes, then you know, we're down to a very, very tiny population. Right. They probably ought to be listed. But if you're willing to accept a little bit of rainbow genetic material in your West Slope cutthroat, then they're doing okay. You know, if you're, yeah. And so the, re the, the Fish and Wildlife Service decided, okay, anything less than 20% rainbow genes, we're going to count as a West Slope cutthroat trout. And uh, therefore, we aren't going to list this thing. Um, and uh, yet the petitioners say, wait, a, you know, that's not fair. And it raises this issue of what is a species and what is a hybrid. And, you know, there's some evidence that these hybrid fish are less fit than uh, the, the purebred fish in these conditions. But at the same time, I think, again, going back to values, clearly one of the reasons, why are we so obsessed with purity, you yeah. know, with absolute pure uh, fish. What's, what is it about that? Are we willing to accept 1%, half a you know, what? It's this fascinating set of values that I think, and again, it's always argued in terms of the science, right. but the, the values also clearly are a major driver that need to be okay. addressed. Well, you've given us a great synopsis. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a yeah. wonderful overview and, and, and. I'll just, there, I'm done. Good, good. That's a, because uh, I want to let people know who haven't had a chance to pick it up, it's uh, a wonderful read. <laughs> it Great. really is. I mean, uh, it, it's, it asks very hard scientific questions about non-native species, hybridization, stuff we deal with today that they've been dealing with since the 1870s. Um, but the stories are great, too. Yeah. I'd forgotten yeah. the Green River story and, and, and did not know the West Slope story, and, and those are fascinating. Yeah, it's a, a lot of fascinating issues. Now, one other aspect you dealt with in here uh, that ties into your, your concluding point about values and so on is... Um, the values anglers uh, bring to the the rainbow mm -hmm. debate that that kind of drives it and uh, is is there a, a, a transition now where anglers are looking for non rainbow um, trout or is is uh, very I think uh, there is but I think it's still small pretty sector. small um, you also talked about how fishing kind of ebbed and, and, yeah. <laughs> and flowed over the yeah, age of it. Was fishing really popular right after the Civil War? Is that what, one of the Oh, spurs it became very this? popular. They had fish and game club, uh, private fish fishing clubs all over the country. And I, it's fun to visit some of those old, old fishing clubs. Um, but also, I think, uh, on an interesting note that I, uh, I'll try to throw in here, it's a little off, off your question, yeah. but one of the you know, justifications often for stocking fish is it creates a constituency for clean water, right? Yep. It gets sure. people out fishing. It gets kids out fishing. Yep. It's the same thing yeah, that came sure. from the 19th century. Um, and I get this question a lot about, so, so, so should we be stocking or shouldn't we be stocking? And first I want to emphasize that it, you know, the book isn't really an advocacy book right. in any way. It's just a story of uh, maybe a parable that hopefully extends more broadly. And, and, and and uh, one of the things that I usually respond to, whether we should be stocking, one of the effects, you know, on the, on the one hand, if you take some fish and you stock them into a reservoir that's already completely modified whatever habitat used to be there, it would seem like no big deal. But on the flip side, um, in, it sends a message, and I notice this with my kids a lot, they think fish come from hatcheries and snow comes from snow guns. And just as, as Marsh tried to create, an, yeah. it's a technological fix. And if people think the technological fix is always available, then they're not going to worry about what they do to the environment and to the habitat. And so, I mean, I, I even draw an extension to climate change, for example. You know that we are so inculcated with this notion that there's always a technological fix that uh, that we cease to worry about sort of these addressing these issues holistically. Um, so, and I guess that also brings me to this final note that one of the really things that I really noticed when I was writing this book is that the rhetoric from the 19th century is so similar to the rhetoric from today. Yeah. They were sure they were doing the right thing, just as we're sure we're doing the right thing today. Even if it's you know restoring native fish, we're sure we're doing the right thing. And I guarantee you, in a hundred years, they're going to be groaning about whatever it is. That we're that we're doing today. So. That's a that's a perfect endpoint too, okay. because uh, uh, that's what historians do. This isn't <laughs> this isn't a policy book, that's right. by any stretch of imagination. It's a it's a thoughtful, uh, 
retelling of, of the story of a fish. And I think it's kind of interesting that we can actually tell histories via one species and, and mm -hmm. uh, illuminate a lot of human history. And that, that's what it does. It's a, it's a good read. There's tons of information. And, and the reader could draw their own judgments after mm -hmm. reading this. I do, I do have to ask you one last question, because I think people might wonder, um, did you get your love of fishing back after <laughs> writing the book? I mean, after writing about rainbow trout and anglers and the, the growth of sport fishing and the post-Civil yeah. War era, did you want to get back out there? And, and uh, Well, in two ways. It, I did, for sure. <laughs> and you got kids, and one of, That'll and draw you kids. back in. Yeah. <laughs> right. So one of them is I love fishing for native subspecies of crowd. I'm, I'm from the West, so I love, because to find these native subspecies right. of cutthroat now, you get to go to these really remote, cool places. Sure. So I love doing that. It's, like the birders and their life list. I have my life list of native trout that I've caught. Uh, but I also really enjoy catching rainbow trout now, like yeah. you say, because, especially hatchery rainbows, because they're so loaded with human history that you pick one up and you hold it and you're holding sort of all the values that, that we have had, all the contradictory values we've had over the last 150 years. They're right there in that one fish. And so I sort of love looking at the fish that way. It's a finned artifact. That's right. <laughs> well, Anders, thank you so much for coming out to NCTC. The book is called An Entirely Synthetic Fish, How Rainbow Trout Beguiled America and Overran the World. And I think just from this brief presentation, you made your case. They, they beguiled us, and they definitely overran six sevenths of the <laughs> continents That's of the right. world. That's right. And uh, you can get the book anywhere, and, and Anders will be giving a a talk this evening at NCTC, and we really appreciate your time, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to tune in, uh, and we'll see you again in a couple months.